I would like to welcome everyone to the stage, actually, we'll not go <laughs> by one by one. I think it's just better to take the seats, yeah, take places. Uh, I'm actually very glad and very thankful to my colleagues and Connections team that Connections School had the stage of this festival for the second time in these two days. I sincerely hope that we will not let you down and we will have an interesting conversation. Uh, as you might know, Connection School was founded in 2015, which is quite a symbolic year, the first year after Maidan in Ukraine. And uh, since then, uh, we oh, realized that basically thanks. one of the big reasons for this uh, public movement during Maidan revolution was provoked by inability of different parts of the society and especially of the political leadership to communicate with other social groups. And this lack of communication produces, of course, inequalities and sometimes even disasters. So since 2015, we have been thinking about this question, how to basically develop and introduce new type of connections between various social groups. And since we are still specialized in the field of urbanism and architecture and spatial planning, we would like to have it as our main goal to uh, find these recipes, how to educate these future agents of change that will develop our cities in the future, develop the future scenarios of how urban areas in Ukraine and beyond will look like. And since then, we have been transforming a lot. I'll take my seat now. <laughs> and uh, I would say that uh, we have five years of history, but each year, Connection School is not the same school as it was in the previous year. Uh, for instance, it's very visible with this educational year when we actually uh, went beyond the city boundary and now started to look at the territories in between settlements, the sudden change. However, I think these basic questions, they stay, uh, they stay very somehow important still to us and we keep asking ourselves other questions, even more complicated questions. This is this game that we play when we have this really complex question and in order to provide a really an ablated answer to that question, we developed a full-scale educational program. And uh, so far, it works well for us. I hope the participants also, but we are having a lot of fun doing that. And uh, also, we are never doing that alone. Uh, throughout our history as a festival, as a school, we do not intend to just to share this very, very humble piece of knowledge that we might have, but we rather invite those who are experts to share their experiences and this is this, exactly this type of connection that we are aiming at as an organization. To have this knowledge transfer that is not one-sided, that is because uh, we also received some positive feedback that people can also learn from Ukraine, not just <laughs> learn Ukrainian, teach Ukrainians something, but also to, to learn here. But uh, in the end of the day, the most important for us is to utilize this knowledge. And we all know that we are living in interesting times now. Uh, so this pathetic title is unfortunately quite, quite relevant and quite true if you are speaking about uh, the, today. And uh, we have this a little bit playful title just to uh, make the conversation uh, flow uh, easily, but we will gonna discuss some very complex questions, I would say, that will be uh, united by this overall topic of getting fit for global urban challenges. I believe that uh, the panel that we have today is very competent to answer this very complicated question and to provide unique recipes that come from various parts of the world and also coming from various professional approaches and various academic disciplines also. And here with us, apart from two curators of Connection School, Miriam Nimaya and Us Toman, we have also representatives of two very important organizations, uh, think tanks, educational institutions, practices. Uh, we have Klaus Overmeyer from Urban Catalyst with us today, and also we have Mike Emmerich from the Independent School for the City. Uh, 
some of them already delivered their presentation at the festival. Klaus was speaking uh, yesterday, and the Independent School for the City had their presentation earlier today. But we would like to have another introduction for each of you. And uh, uh, I personally am very, wor like, I'm worrying a little bit, so I will just pretend that this hall does not exist, and I'm sitting in the living room with you, and we have this interesting conversation. Because while I even have these two colleagues of mine sitting near close to me, it is not very often that we have a conversation about important matters, even three of us not speaking about the great guests that we have today, and we're very privileged to have you all here. Uh, so I will start with the person whom I know, uh, with Miriam, who is an architect, an urbanist, and uh, urban designer. And uh, Miriam has been working with Connections for five years. It's almost an anniversary. Congrats, and thank you <laughs> for, for your continuous commitment. And uh, I would say that uh, Every year, with all of these five years, were five years of progress, really, because she uh, employed more and more like this progressively responsible role at Connections, starting as a uh, tutor, mentor, now moving on to curatorial role, and also being our advisory board member. Also, she has a practice of her own that she's been uh, running for 10 years now. It's called Helsinki Zurich. It is based in Helsinki, and you can maybe guess the second city which is not Kiev, but Zurich. Maybe <laughs> Kiev will be added. Yeah? Not yet. <laughs> nice idea. And uh, also, yeah, I would actually like to start our dialogue with that. So you are, your interest in connections does not seem to be an, some kind of coincidence. It seems to be very strategic, I would say. And uh, with adopting this progressively more and more responsible roles in connections, I would, uh, you also stretched your responsibilities a lot. So I would like to ask you the first question, which is why are you interested in our organization? And why do you think this organization is the right place to actually answer to this question, how to fit the global urban challenges? Yeah, thank you for introducing me, Diego. Uh, can you hear me? That's just okay. Um, so I okay. It was not like uh, absolute co coincidence that I started to um, be engaged. Uh, the reason was actually that I know Urs for quite a long time. We have been um, colleagues also a long time ago. So that's why I, I heard about uh, the activities of Connections in the beginning, but. Um, I have to say, next to uh, my um, practical experience um, in the international background, because we, we as an office, we are an anyway already by um, having offices in two cities, we have already, we are international oriented, but we had also uh, been working on projects uh, in a lot of co different countries in Western and Eastern Europe. And besides that, I was, um, before I opened my own office, I was um, conducting and conceptualizing a research project at the ETH of Zurich. And in that project already, um, it was on the topic of the agglomeration of Zurich at the chair of Kees Christiansen. And in that project already, it was a quite big project. I think we were around 40 or 50 researchers from different um, institutes, actually. So this was, this was already set out um, trans and interdisciplinary. And that was the first time when I kind of um, got really interested in uh, understanding better the, the different perspectives uh, of uh, different disciplines and also understood that, for instance, the uh, agglomeration, which is also a very complex space, can be only understood if you um, understand different perspectives. So, and when I heard that um, Connections is actually uh, one of its the, the basic um, attempts was actually to engage uh, interdisciplinary discourse and learning, I was very interested and that's why I started and um, that's why I'm still here. I think it's a, it's a very important institution in Ukraine and um, it's supporting uh, strongly um, the um, professional um, education of uh, urbanists, let's say, in the country. 
Uh, when we are speaking about interdisciplinary discourse and learning, in the context, let's say, of the educational programs that Connection is running, how exactly this interdisciplinary discourse is actually embedded into that programs? What, what is your feeling about that? What's your evaluation of this? What, what makes our program in this interdisciplinary? Um, it is interdisciplinary because it w is per se. Um, every time there is an open call, we are looking for people um, from different backgrounds, uh, from uh, with different backgrounds, professional backgrounds, and they are working together in teams. That's one thing. And then on the other hand, it has also this aspect of um, exchanging uh, between uh, practitioners and um, people who are studying. So this is another um, specific, uh, specific aspect. So yeah, that, that's the, um, I would say, that's it. Thank you. And to be a little bit more specific and not to speak in abstract terms, I would like to refer to one of the programs or rather short term courses of Connection School that you were creating. Uh, mm -hmm. This one is quite symbolic to us because uh, this was a workshop uh, dedicated to future development scenarios of Mestetsky Arsenal, which all of you know, I guess. Uh, we were trying to rethink how this space works. Also, I think the venue for today's gathering is also in a way symbolic because normally this very nice uh, even, even if neglected, still very nice what the front area is normally closed and restricted. You cannot easily enter it. So in a way we are activating it and we are using this uh, underutilized space. Uh, it was my feeling that with the arsenal the, the objective was also somehow similar to utilize this uh, potential of the uh, that, that is now hidden somehow or restricted. So I would like to make a more general question out of it. Uh, speaking of global urban challenges, do you believe that uh, we actually can uh, address them using the resources that are already there but are somehow not used or underutilized or not used for the correct purpose? Well, that's, um, that's a good question. We can, I would say that in the framework of that project or workshop it was um, challenged or tackled. Maybe to give a little, uh, little more background to the ones who don't know about this, um, the Mistetsky Arsenal is a, um, is a formal weapon arsenal or also a factory for weapons used to be and um, it was opened I think 2015 um, to the public so it's actually a public building since then and it works as an art museum. But uh, when we started uh, to work on this project in the, in the framework of the workshop, we realized that it's not really open. So it's for many times over the year, it's closed. There's no one, um, um, you cannot enter it. There's only in, in limited times, there, is, there are exhibitions. And um, so, and when there are um, programs, it's only a very, um, there's only a very limited amount of space used. So it has three stories and only the ground floor and from the ground floor only very little spaces are used. So in that sense, of course, um, it's a very underused space in the, in the city center, which has a very um, a, a big um, meaning, of course, for, for, the, for the citizens of Zurich, uh, for, of, of Kiev and of Ukraine. And on the other hand, I think it was also an important question to pose um, what is actually the future of a museum? What is a museum? Is it only about exhibiting art pieces or could it be also have other functions? Could it also incorporate other social um, aspects? That was, um, I would say that was the most uh, important um, two points we discovered. Thank you. I indeed agree that this, this structure, Mestetsky Arsenal, has a very high symbolic value for, for Ukraine. And I think we'll keep this discussion going about how to use something that is now underutilized. And mm -hmm. uh, to also continue with the introductions, I have a final question to you in this round. Uh, Prior to this discussion, uh, I was uh, willing to request one uh, example of particular 
project from each of the panelists that would somehow reflect how global urban challenges of today reflect their own professional practice. And I was somehow surprised to see an example from Basel, because <laughs> Basel outskirts, uh, we are speaking about global urban challenges today. Basel, everything supposed to be fixed now by now, no? It should be a prosperous space. <laughs> Isn't it like that? Yeah, well, it is a prosperous space, of course. Basel is one of the um, growing regions in, uh, in Central Europe, or Western Europe, sorry, we are in Central Europe. Um, maybe to, it is, a, I, I choose on, uh, on purpose, it, it's like an urban design project, like a classic um, urban design project. It's a project f um, over 21 hectares um, providing a living space for 4,000 people and um, working space for 3,000 people. So it's a really big, one of the biggest um, remaining area, um, development areas in the, in the region. Why I choose it is because it's actually showing um, quite some um, typical challenge which we are face, uh, facing today. So the site is on the one hand, uh, it is um, in the middle, it's like a, a, the last piece of land unused between an active industrial site and on the other hand a residential uh, neighborhood which is kind of has a very bad reputation at the moment. It's in the outskirts of Basel. It is also bordered by rail tracks and a highway, which you can see in the, in the south, the rail tracks here, and then in the, in the north, um, the river Rhine, uh, the riverfront, but it's not accessible. So for us, the question was how to actually um, develop or create um, a neighborhood which can um, provide, uh, or it can, how can, a, let's say, a future-oriented uh, neighborhood look like, and what does it need to become a place where today is nothing. So that, that was, uh, and also another thing was of course that we were working um, in an interdisciplinary team. The normal thing is that you, we, were, you worked, we worked with architects, um, uh, we were architects, uh, urban designers, urban planners, traffic planners, which is kind of the classic, um, I would say, for um, urban design projects, but besides that we had also someone supporting with, um, let's say, social um, processes uh, and participation. And we had also one, uh, someone who helped with like kind of business development questions. So inter interdisciplinarity arises again, now not in the educational context, but in the professional yeah. context. Yeah, and maybe one more thing, it was also the whole process was laid out in that uh, sense that we had um, a series of workshops where we were in kind of in, in touch with the landowners, um, the ones who were um, the developers, politicians, and of course experts. So it was kind of in, a, in many ways um, trans and multidisciplinary, let's say. Yeah. Thank you, Miriam, and we will continue with the introductions. And now I'm very glad and flattered to introduce uh, uh, our next speaker, who is uh, Mike Emmerich, who is an urban designer and a partner at Crimson Architecture Historians and Urbanists, and also school coordinator of the newly founded Independent School for the City. Uh, I would like to actually start from this picture that you cannot see probably from here, but this is a picture of a spring school. Uh, which was entitled Borders Are for Crossing and that was held in Amsterdam in March this year and uh, where Connection School was also involved. But uh, for you it was also one of the first events conducted by your school and uh, uh, I was uh, actually very interested to read uh, this mission statement that was written on your website. I hope you did not do that for connections, but I actually extracted a quote from there, which I now like to transform into a question. It says uh, literally that today's cities demand a new kind of urbanism. So starting the independent school for the city, what kind of urbanism will actually be a subject for research and review in there, and what will you deliver? Well, um well, in, in the first thing is that uh, uh, the spring school that we, that we organized with Connections, uh, it took part in Rotterdam, actually. So the other, 
the second biggest city of the Netherlands, uh, where our office is based as well. Um, the, for us, the reason to, to start the independent school was uh, initially actually uh, related to two things or two observations. And on the one hand, um, it came from the idea that from our own experience in, in education, in, in universities, uh, especially the University of uh, Delft in the Netherlands, um, we noticed actually that um, um, uh, what, you, what, you, what you see is that a lot of projects that are being, uh, being uh, developed by students, that they're kind of restricted by the fact that you have to graduate on a design. So actually the fact that like the exit criteria of, uh, of a university uh, also limit a little bit the, the scope of solutions in which you can, uh, can act. So one of, the, uh, one of the reasons also to start the independent school was to, to really look at a much more interdisciplinary way of, of education in which uh, not only architecture and urban design but also uh, Architectural history, uh, sociology, um, um, uh, yeah, all sorts of research tools actually to to investigate the city were br are brought together, and that kind of creates already a new type of urbanism. It, it's it's not the planner just sitting behind the desk and drawing up what he thinks is the the best solution for a certain area. But it, it, it kind of stimulates uh, an architect or an urban planner to, to really go into the field, do proper research on a location, and based on that research and the initiatives that already take place in an area, uh, to use that to kind of build upon to, towards a new type of area. And I think this is already, uh, um, yeah, like the, a, a new type of urbanism uh, than what we have seen in the past for. So a new type of urbanism that implies new kind of connections between the actors who are involved into producing this urbanism and also this can new connection between disciplines. Yeah, and mm -hmm. not only trying to understand the, um, um, the spatial specifics of a location, but also like the hidden, uh, more cultural specifics and uh, the social bonds that are there and uh, yeah, the social dynamics of a place. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, also I was... Uh, very impressed and uh, by the project reference that you provided for this presentation, which comes from your own professional practice, uh, which relates to Gaza village in uh, Lebanon, uh, which is a small village of uh, 8,000 inhabitants that uh, since recently has been experiencing an influx of uh, refugees who escaped the Syrian conflict. A lot of them are under 18 years old, very young people, and uh, this particular project uh, uh, focuses on a public park in this new village. So understanding that there are a lot of barriers, mental, social barriers, between this newly arrived population and the local population, how this project addresses this borders issue. Do you comment on that? Yeah, so, so this, this was a very nice project also for me to, to kind of uh, get involved with because it's, it's such, a, such a difficult situation. I think in Rasse, um, it's located in the Beka Valley, so in between uh, Syria and, uh, and Beirut uh, in Lebanon. And it's, it's really representing uh, the issue that you see in whole of Lebanon. So um, Rasse has indeed... Uh, around 8,000 uh, inhabitants, but they got, on a certain moment, they got 11,000 refugees living in the city. So the, the city really more than doubled. And uh, the pressure that that creates on the, uh, well, not, not on, on the local, on the host communities, actually. Um, uh, so in terms of uh, garbage disposal, fresh water, um, um, uh, infrastructure, but also in public space. Um, is immense, and we we came there with the idea that to um, to actually work on housing um, because people are living in horrible uh, housing conditions. Intense, actually. Intense, yeah, yeah. And uh, so our idea was okay. Let's try to see if we can we can improve the the housing situation. But politically, that was such a complicated issue. Like everything that looks like it becomes more permanent was politically like a no go. 
So then we started talking with people and starting talking with NGOs on location. And then eventually we came to, this, to the conclusion like we should not, or it's impossible to invest in housing. So let's see if we can invest in a park. Because in, in, in Rasse you have um, the historical village, then you have a, a big green area, and then you have a lot of the informal tented settlements. And uh, by, by improving that park or that green area, we thought like let's, let's see if we can make a collective space out of this in which both the local community as well as the, as the refugees can at least um, um, can use the space and maybe also interact on the, in that space. Uh, do I understand correctly that the project is still in the making? And yeah. Yeah, so um, before, the, before the winter they started uh, construction, um, we introduced actually a couple of kind of straightforward um, uh, interventions of um, on the one hand creating a pathway that connects both places uh, but also that links uh, schools that are in that area to each other. Um, and that construction that started before, the, before winter, and then in the winter it was, it was uh, 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 yeah, nothing happened for, for some time. And now they're picking up again uh, the development, so I hope that it will be finished in the coming two, three months. So. Yes, and thank, thank you, first of all, for, for this project and this feels like a real forefront of the challenges that we are discussing today. And uh, with this, I would like to give a word to Klaus Overmeyer, uh, who asked to introduce himself as a skilled gardener and a mentor for urban transformation, which is the <laughs> expression that I like. And I think I need to invent something equally cool for myself when I grow up a little bit. <laughs> and uh, my first question actually relates to your first encounter of Kiev, because you told me today that it was the first, uh, the first impression that you made of the city was during the Arche tour that was organized within uh, this festival. So I was really, really uh, curious uh, about your opinion of the landscapes that you observed during this, this walk and also the, the sale. Yeah, um, my observation was that the landscape has a strong impact on the image of the city. So uh, you see these green hills and steep uh, slopes everywhere. And um, to me, the, the river is also very uh, wild, open and rough. And somehow the landscape is, um, is yeah, quite uncontrolled and uh, it introduces a kind of uh, informal um, energy to the, to the um, city. Today, this morning, uh, I walked around, we had a short round trip with some of your colleagues here in Pudil and um, I found out that there is a, a strong lack of landscape architecture, so all the open spaces, they are not designed, and they are, so the, the landscape or the open space has become a platform for automatic urbanism or informal economies, uh, informal parking, uh, informal ruins, or even, places for the, uh, which are appropriated by the church. Uh, they put a cross there first and then they build a church. And so f to me in Kiev, the landscape has, has, a, has a strong informal impact on the urban development. Thank you for your impression and for your also hints. Uh, and also thank you for your yesterday's presentation. Uh, for those who have not attended it, uh, would like to remind that Klaus uh, uh, is a co-founder or founder of the office called Urban Catalyst, which actually used to be a research project at the Technical University of Berlin, and now become, has become a full-fledged uh, practice. And uh, so my question is, what catalyzed this transformation from a research project, which was supposed to be temporary, into a permanent practice? Uh, at that time, I had um, two kids and the research project uh, ran out, it, it was over, so I, was, I wasn't financed anymore. And 
uh, I, I didn't know how to go on at all. And uh, I thought the name Urban Catalyst, is, uh, this was the only uh, resource I had. And I <laughs> put all risk onto this name and said, well, uh, let's um, found Urban Catalyst as a, as a private practice and a spin-off of the research project. And of course, um, in the first phase, I, uh, I got back to, to my roots as a landscape architect. And um, Case Christiansen was, he was the formal director of the, of the research project and we cooperated in, a, in many urban design projects at that time. And so uh, this was, was my start uh, in my personal office. Thank you for this uh, honest and inspiring answer. And I would like to ask about the project that is now on the screen that you prepared for us. It is about the area in Cologne. Do you understand that? Could you tell us about it? Yeah, just quite briefly. It's an, uh, it is a -central, centrally located transformation area in south of Cologne. And um, it's an area which is, uh, I think it's 120 hectares. And the idea was uh, to prolong the green belt to the river Rhine and to finance this huge uh, park idea uh, to, to have um, housing developments uh, on the borders of the, the park. And our job was to uh, design a process and to implement this process, uh, a planning and participatory pro process. So five planning teams were integrated and um, they had to present their, not their final designs, but their analysis, their first ideas, and also their, their ongoing designs to a broader public. And we asked uh, these teams to, to make it very haptical. So they were not allowed to come up with a PowerPoint presentation, but they had uh, 15 minutes to build their idea in a walkable model. And this is what you see uh, on the image. And um, although all the buildings are, are not uh, on a precise scale like architects do, uh, it was very easy for the audience to grasp the basic idea of each team and to criticize or to emphasize certain aspects uh, in this idea. And so um, the crucial point of this was that uh, there there was a, a debate around these models, not only on the shapes of the buildings and the park, but also on um, global challenges like uh, flood protection, affordable housing, um, uh, post fossil mobility, or dynamic park on, uh, development. And uh, so these, um, these models have become a uh, link between global challenges and local realities. Uh, you are a great believer in public participation and uh, since I like reading manifestos of all kinds and these mission statements, I also read yours, which says in particular that urban development can no longer do without participation. And I have a difficult question related to this statement. Uh, we realize that we live in the times of populist movements of all kinds uh, which actually uh, use this public opinion or use this notion of the majority and sometimes they perverse it uh, and direct it against uh, climate change mitigation or other global challenges or lead to increased xenophobia. So what actually makes you think that involvement people produces positive results and makes a better future, isn't it better to involve professionals with the right values? I think this is uh, the only chance we have to involve people and to launch debates on, on our uh, future. I can understand that people, that they are scared because uh, the world is changing so rapidly. So we undergo uh, an enormous change and people are afraid that they will lose uh, their, 
their welfare. And I think this is, of course, the breeding ground for all these uh, populism, uh, populism um, motions. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, I think uh, there are a lot of initiatives in economy and society where we become aware that we, that we have to radically shift our resources and um, we only can shift them if we have common visions, either on the global scale or on a local mm -hmm. micro scale. And we have to uh, negotiate and fight and build and uh, discuss these, this vision. And this is for me obvious that uh, uh, participation is uh, the means to, to, to reach our goals. Mm -hmm. Thank you, and Urban Catalyst serves as an inspiration for a lot of organizations in Ukraine, something that I definitely know, and thank you again for coming to the festival to share your expertise and experience. And I would like to involve into our discussion a colleague of mine, Urs Thoman, who is a Swiss urban planner and co-founder of Connection School, but uh, also I would like to add something to your introduction, also to end a great friend of Ukraine, which I think is very true, and uh, you have been uh, working and living in Ukraine for many years now, and uh, related to that, I would like to ask, uh, do you feel on the forefront of global challenges here? And if, in what way? Um, thank you, Yegor. So, yeah, on, on the one hand, definitely um, here in Ukraine, especially I would say also in this place, there are, there are some kind of, I would say, desire, desires concerning cities which are part of a global trend we all like and I think I, we should deserve safe cities, clean cities, um, prosperous cities and maybe efficiency is also so, such a, such a buzzword, so this is a topic um, which in Ukraine we see in the discourse and we are oriented to Europe, we are talking anyway uh, a lot about this. Um, also I would say some challenges of the global challenges are, are, are very visible also in Ukraine, so it's concerning access to public service, services and so on. What I would say which is probably the most important thing where uh, Ukraine is, it's, it's the relationship between citizens and governments. So everything what is related to, po to power, so somehow in, in Ukraine we are, yeah, it's a global power game unfortunately, which is going on, which is um, um, going on with Ukraine as one of the hotspots. Um, but also in the relation, and in this, in this context here in Ukraine, we try somehow to formulate our relationships as citizens, as professionals, with um, institutions, what the future is of institutions, what, um, what relations, how they work together. Um, I, um, I think this is the big, one of the big global questions if we want to solve questions like um, yeah, access to food and so. And here I would say, yes, in Ukraine we are somehow on the forefront of uh, global challenges, somehow also a place where Experience, yeah, we, we, we are collecting experience with, we, uh, with these new challenges, which is of big value, I'm sure, also for the Western world. Thank you for your answer, and it seems that focusing our attention on Ukraine is somehow contributing to this addressing global urban challenges. But I also have another question related to also location and focus of our activities. Uh, when we say global urban challenges, we mean something that happens in large urbanized areas, yet you and I, we spent all of the last year working with uh, Ukrainian hinterlands, countryside, ruralness. Do you think we did anything wrong or? <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, the, of course, um, if you open the newspapers or listen some documentary or looking to some, do do watching some documentary on the TV, um, Many of them, it starts with more than 50% of people live in city. What about the other almost 50%? So look at from the perspective um, of the still 
also almost 50%. Um, this is one imp important aspect. Um, we, uh, yeah, which a lot of the challenges that we have in the cities, they are really deep related with what is going on in the con on the countryside. Also concerning again with polit politics, I think um, analyzing the story of Brexit, some some um, uh, British economist, I think, he said it was a battle between the somewheres and the anywheres. So a lot of our, about if we call um, in our times, um, as Klaus said, things are uh, changing rapidly. Um, orientation, or you could also say identifications. I prefer the term orientation, is uh, very important and um, so from this point of view or from with this, it is very important to take care about the rural areas, to give a voice <laughs> to these peoples, um, to these places, um, still they are very seen as resources, also um, if we discuss energy efficiency, clean energy um, for the cities, for urban areas. Um, we have it in, in, in Ukraine, it's an it's a actual topic. So new solar, um, yeah, PV, photovolta photovoltaic, which are somewhere on the countryside. Of course, this is a nice solution and somehow for people in the cities or could be a clean solution, but it has clear consequences in areas where people are very deep also um, identify themselves with the landscape structures that they have, and uh, yes, so the, um, it is not only very important to take care about so about rural areas. It's also we saw it in our in our few months that we now in in the studio. So incredibly interesting. Uh, thank you, Urs, and you provided this project reference, which comes from Ukraine. It's Vinnytsia. Could you tell us more about it? Yeah, I, of, I of course had to <laughs> to bring this picture because it's somehow um, yeah the reason how I started to how I started to become act, active and engaged in Ukraine. It's one of the first pro, pro, um, projects that I did in Ukraine, and it shows a lot of um, I think s several layers. So first um, uh, one important thing i think how we were how we were able to do this project the project the name of the project is somehow it is called integrated urban transport and spatial planning strategy which is really a planning term i think buzzword integrated in it is is important it's about mobility in the city which is also one of the big challenges especially in even bigger, much bigger cities than Vinnytsia is. Um, but um, how we were able to do these projects is we were able to do it under the term of energy efficiency, global buzzword, energy efficiency, um, allowed on the one hand to, to get funding of this pro pro project. On the other hand, it was also only possible because the mayor of the city, he was open, he saw the need of new approaches, new also informal instruments of new ways of communications with, um, with, um, yeah, with, 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 with his citizens, with biz business in the city, with uh, technocrats. And um, but it's probably the most interesting or the most va also yeah two 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 um, uh, aspects from the spatial structure I would like to um, explain also this project if you see the picture most you identify it's about landscape so mobility but in the end the dominating thing on this picture is land landscape the connection of the city to its river, which in this case not is developing of a riverfront, not access to the river doesn't necessarily mean riverfront developments, economic development. It, when studying the identi identity of a place, also Klaus again, he started when he explained um, how he is traveling in, in, in Kiev, I think in many cities in Central Eastern Europe, we still have this luxury of kind of a distance between 
the water and the urbanized area. And the last thing probably which is very important in, in this project allowed our office, I also partly working in an office in Zurich for the Wettering Atelier for Städtebau, um, it allowed us somehow to things clearer, uh, to see things clearer. Here we developed, identified the central urban core, so we call, called it the concept, which is a simple way to, where, um, to focus to, uh, for the development of the city, to make um, efficient, effective de decisions, which we learned here and afterwards applied in an adapted way, several times also now, in, 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 it also influenced our practice in Switzerland with Swiss, with Swiss cities. Thank you, Urs. And I think with this round, we have created a solid empirical basis to address the announced topic of getting fit for global urban challenges. But also, I believe that it should be our ambition to provide some recipes. And for that, we have a few more questions. And I would appreciate if you could answer them in this blitz manner. And although they are quite complex, we try to come up with specific and concise answers to them. And the first one is, um, yeah. Uh, how can planning and design, teaching and practice reflect the complexity of zones in transition? And on this question, I would like to hear something from Miriam and from Mike. Okay. I, I will answer it uh, shortly. I think um, when uh, taking the programs of connections as a reference, um, I would say um, the programs are specifically about um, on the one hand, um, of course, dealing with uh, city development topics. In each program, we are challenging or asking the questions, what are the challenges which are um, having impact on, on, the, on the cases we are working on? But on the other hand, I think what we teach um, uh, very much is actually to, um, to create a mutual understanding between um, disciplines. So it's not so much about like a perfectly designed neighborhood in the end, but it's more about actually designing a process, a process which um, integrates um, important people, meaning stakeholders, actors, trying to find out who needs to be activated in order to actually make a change. So often we are dealing with uh, political issues, we are dealing with, of course, economic issues, um, ecological issues, social issues. So it's not, um, I would say, um, someone who um, participated in our connection studio, he, he, uh, he or she is, uh, is kind of became a generalist in the sense to understand actually what are the forces um, having an impact on, on a city development project or a project in an urban context, let's say. Thank you. Mike, your take on that question? Yeah, yeah I, com I completely agree with Miriam. I think it's, it's, it's extremely important to, to really, really try to understand the area that you're working in, in all these different facets. And uh, mm -hmm. if you're talking about um, zones in transition or like uh, uh, places that uh, that are changing. I think the whole world is currently in transition. Eh? If you, if, if, even if, if it's a city or the countryside or even the seascapes, there's so much things going on in terms of um, global migration. Um, uh, if you look at the, the climate change, but also the energy transition. Um, if you look at social inequality or like uh, spatial inequality all around the world, I think that those are topics that we really have to engage with and that we shouldn't uh, only try to uh, solve in a one one uh, 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 from f on a one-sided view, but really have to look at those issues, um, yeah, all together. Because um, I think only then we can kind of um, formulate a solid answer to uh, to these transitions. Can I, can I add you. one more thing? Because I forgot one important thing. Maybe you saw people walking around with these t-shirts, can act. I would say this is also some, something really important uh, in, the, in all the studios we, um, we conducted, that at some point it is about, um, on the one hand, uh, for participants to 
realize that they can make an impact, that they are able to, to make a change, um, because of course when you, when you work in this context you find a lot of challenges, maybe even more than you would find in a, in a Western context. And then it's often or mostly always about you know, bringing the ideas or the concepts which have been developed to, um, to some people, uh, bring it uh, to the audience, to the open, um, to, the, yeah, to the public and discuss what, what was uh, found. So that's how um, I'm off, I know I'm on again. <laughs> So that's how, I think this is really one important aspect I just wanted to add to um, Thank you, Miriam. Yes. Yeah, definitely can act is much more than a motto. <laughs> uh, related to this question, yet there is another which now I would like to come up with and which uh, is uh, formulated as follows. What kind of knowledge and resource networks are required for supporting and managing this needed change in the context of local and global challenges that our city is facing nowadays. And I would like to hear from Urs and Klaus on that question. Um, I would say the most important, it's not even a knowledge <laughs> or resource, it needs patience and time. Um, I really like the way, um, the way how Klaus introduced herself, himself as a gardener. I read sometimes, some time ago, I read a book from a, from a general, former general of the American army about the leadership, about collaboration, and he used the metaphor of a, of a gardener, so as a new kind of leader. Or to, if you if you want to if you want to change something, it needs a lot of care, taking care, believe. Yeah, these plants, they are growing, take care of them, look for the weather, the context, what is happening, help them. And uh, I think this is something that um, with connections, with the uh, also the network that we have, we have um, um, some, re some re bringing in resources to can other uh, to, to cities or communities, um, even also just to, to areas. Um, and our role, or especially also my role in my projects in Ukraine, it's a lot. It, it, it's a lot about to, yeah, just let things, making let things happen, and uh, yeah, to finish maybe again to, to this story in Vinitsa, it started with this broad concept, which some kind of a top-down approach. Now, um, also with the help of connections and all the teams, uh, as I don't know how many students um, from Vinitsa uh, you had, um, Mir Miriam, so it's, it's um, and they doing their things, it's realizing small pieces, um, and with the help and support to let them happen, I think things can grow. Thank you. Klaus? Yeah. I would say that we uh, need transformation knowledge. <laughs> and <laughs> this is, uh, of course, uh, well, what is transformation knowledge? On the one hand, I think it's, of course, a disciplinary knowledge uh, from architects or technologists or whatever. But on the other hand, transformation knowledge is, of course, a knowledge of different stakeholders and parties and we have to make this knowledge visible and bring it together. And a third point to me is that we have to uh, connect a macro and micro scale. So mm -hmm. if we, if we um, uh, work in micro scales and neighborhoods, we have to uh, have a close link to these overall global questions and uh, vice versa. Mm -hmm. Thank you, and with that I would like to transit to the final question of this panel, uh, which is formulated as follows. How can collective knowledge and non-formal education be utilized for studying the complexity of today's urbanized areas? And I think this question could uh, summarize our discussion. This is why I would like to hear from each of you. Anyone like to start? Well, if, like if, if you would ask me, I think um, the, the most important thing that, that uh, non-formal education can offer is actually to get out of academia and to really start researching the, 
let's say, the real world and uh, try to engage with the stakeholders uh, mm -hmm. on site and use their collective knowledge to kind of formulate plans and, uh, yeah. Thank you, Mike. Yeah, yeah maybe in, in addition to this, of course, that's absolutely right. <laughs> what you say, that's, that's what you can do. You have the freedom to, um, to design um, the teaching ground, let's say, um, in, in, these, in these frameworks. What I also found, uh, found very um, important is, um, this is not very much related to this, but still I want to, um, I want to address it, that um, to um, make um, also students understand that they have a responsibility, that you have a responsibility and that you have um, also um, that you are, um, that it's really about uh, kind of um, taking, when, once you realize that you have a responsibility, you also make decisions in a different way. So you're not anymore just asking for, I, I want to have this and this and this, but you have to also really address the question, is it actually possible or is this also according to values, other values I have, or is it according to, um, challenges we face on a global scale. So I think this is, um, so this this is something which has to be addressed today, I think, in any kind of educational um, environments. So Commitment yeah. and mm. reality check. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I was thinking about a, a non-disciplinary learning environment because we all speak of interdisciplinary and we think of traffic planners and landscape architects and uh, mm -hmm. urbanists putting together. But um, I think in, in future for uh, universities and schools it would be important to, uh, to integrate um, any knowledge in, in these design processes uh, to go on site and also, as Miriam said, to take uh, responsibility for the own decisions. Mm -hmm. And of course, for us as planners, this is a big uh, paradox because on the one hand, we want to focus on our skills, on really on our uh, competences as architects. And on the, on the other hand, there's the challenge to integrate other disciplines or mm -hmm. efforts and this maybe uh, is a big challenge for for the schools to find a right balance because in the end if you are not do not have the uh, good competences as architect or planners you uh, you will also fail and all this uh, non-disciplinary transformation knowledge this doesn't help you <laughs> Disciplinarity is fine as long as you're a professional in your own discipline. That's very reasonable advice. Uh, yeah, to add on this, I, all, all on this, I would say I think we have the luxury with connections or with uh, non-formal education, not necessarily to have to be the most efficient, <laughs> uh, but just we can be effective. And I think this is what makes the difference, just to be effective. And uh, to, um, from a maybe global view or of a, of a view of a, let's say, integrated view, uh, for this it's really important just to have kind of a shared consciousness. What is, what we are you talking? We don't have to need really to use the most sophisticated, most proper term for it. We just have to understand if I say this, my um, counterpart, he has to say, I mean, I mean this. So I think find this common link. And uh, this is um, what uh, thank God um, in connections, uh, the, the conditions that we also allow, also our partners which we um, work, work to, together allow us to bring people from public sectors, from civil society, different professional knowledge, um, background, um, old people, young people together and just doing something together. So professionalism in your field and also openness to interdisciplinary encounters, effectiveness over efficiency and also commitment to the cause, even if it's an educational project, I think will make 
our recipes on how to get for global urban challenges today. And uh, since I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation that Connection School is never the same, always evolving, always transforming, always exploring, I will now also hand over the stage to one of our panelists, Miriam Nimaya, who will talk more specifically how we plan to address the issue of localizing global urban challenges, working with the context of housing in the next year of Connection School. I would like to thank to all of the panelists. I enjoyed this discussion greatly. I was also very glad to see so many of you staying for it. I hope it was also interesting for you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Diego. <laughs> and of course, <laughs> I didn't know that you have it as a last. 